Mary, read me a story. I can't. I have to finish sewing this shirt. Stop bouncing. You'll make your limp worse. Won't. I want to look at my new school today. Do you think they'll notice my limp, Mary? Rest your leg now, Charles. You could try resting your tongue as well. I wish you didn't have to sew. So do I. Tell me a story. The play Mr Salt gave us yesterday. Cymbeline? Will that make you go to sleep? Yes, it's like a fairy tale. <clears throat> In ancient Britain lived a king called Cymbeline. He had three children, two sons and one daughter. Like us? Were they called John, Mary and Charles? No. One day, the king's two sons were stolen away, leaving only their sister. No one ever knew what had become of them, and the king remarried. A cruel woman who never loved the Princess Imogen. Real mothers love their children, don't they? Imogen's only friend was a boy called Posthumus. That means after death. Yes, he was born after his father died. It's from the Latin, you know. Mr Salt says they'll teach me Latin at school, and Greek. You have remembered to say thank you to Mr Salt, haven't you? If it weren't for him, you and John would never have this opportunity. Not many employers would be so good. I know. I wish we had our own house, though, instead of living in this wine cellar. Are you listening to this story or not? Imogen and Posthumus grew up together, studying lessons and playing. Like we do. Shh. But they were not brother and sister like us. So when they grew up, they fell in love. Posthumus was forced to leave, and while he was away, he heard that Imogen had been unfaithful. How stupid he was. Why didn't he trust her? Mary? Mary! Stop pothering your brains and help me. Mr Salt has called for some burgundy. Why doesn't John help? Why is it always you? Mary! 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 Imogen ran away. In the forest, her brothers found her. They rescued her. That's where the story ought to end. She should forget about husbands. She should stay with her brothers and live happily ever after. Ancient Britain was ruled by King Cymbeline, a warrior king who would face the Romans in battle. The king was sad because his two sons had been stolen away. Everyone believed that they were dead, and although the king searched far and wide, he never found them. Only his daughter remained, Imogen, who was heir to the whole kingdom. The king married again, but his new wife was a cruel and wicked woman who was unkind to Imogen. The little girl would have been very unhappy, except for her one friend, Posthumus, a fatherless boy at the court. The two friends grew up, went to school and played together, so it was not surprising that when they were old enough, they fell in love and were secretly married. The Queen had been plotting to marry Imogen to her own son, so that he would one day inherit the throne. When she discovered what had happened, she was furious. At once she went to the King. By telling him lies, she made him so angry that he banished Posthumus from Britain. Far away in exile, Posthumus could not help boasting to everyone he met about his wife's beauty and perfect character. He was foolish enough to agree to a bet that his wife would always be faithful. Because of this bet, a man travelled to the court of King Cymbeline. There he bribed a servant to peek into Imogen's bedroom and steal her bracelet. He told Posthumus that he had seduced his wife and produced the bracelet as proof. Rather than trusting his wife, Posthumus was convinced she had been unfaithful. 
In a rage, he ordered a servant to return to Britain and kill Imogen. The servant took Imogen into the forest. But in spite of his orders, he could not bring himself to murder her, so he told her to run away. Weeping and unable to understand why her beloved husband would believe lies about her, Imogen wandered in the forest. She was cold and hungry, lost and afraid. She takes shelter in a cave belonging to two young hunters. They offer her food and warmth and ask her to stay with them. Without even knowing why, all three of them exclaim over each other's faces, voices, movement. There is much more to come. A Roman army will march and the old warrior King Cymbeline will do battle again. A liar will confess his tricks. A foolish husband will be sorry. The wicked queen will die. But this is the real happy ending. This is where we shall end our story. With Imogen and her two brothers in the forest. And even though they do not know their relationship or their background, Still, all three of them know that in each other's company, they have come home. And what is family more than that? I would rescue you, Mary. I waited 11 years for you to rescue me. And then you were born. Coleridge, isn't it? I wondered if you'd like a slice of this pie? My... my sister bought it for me. Of course, if you don't want it, I could share it with the matron. But she already ate all the meat for our dinner. <laughs> Unless you think the pie might make her explode. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your sister? I saw talking to you in the cloister. My sister used to make pies for me. And your brother, John? He graduates this year, doesn't he? He never talks to me here. Actually, he never talks to me at home either. But none of the other boys will beat you, not knowing how big your brother is. I miss my family. Home feels so far away. You could, if you wanted to. My home is just a ra I mean, on the next half holiday. You could visit, if you wanted. Really? The thing is... I should tell you that we are, that my home is, that we are poor. <laughs> it's a school for poor boys. My father's a vicar, you know. We're poor as church mice. Not poor like us. My father is a, a servant. A very good servant. A clerk, really. To Mr. Salt. A lawyer. Hardly a servant at all. Some are born great. Others achieve greatness. And some have greatness thrust upon them. <laughs> the Twelfth Night. I prefer Shakespeare to Latin, don't you? Uh, have you learned the poem he set us? When that I was a little time boy With hey-ho, the wind and the rain A foolish thing was but a toy For the rain, it rained and every day but when I came to man's estate With hey-ho, the wind and the rain Against knaves and thieves men shut their gate For the rain it rained every day But when I came, alas, to wife With hey-ho, the wind and the rain by swaggering could I never thrive For the rain it raineth every day But when I come unto my bed <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I wish I were coming with you. It's such bad luck not getting the scholarship just because of your... just because of a tiny stammer. You can't blame them for thinking I'd make a terrible vicar. Say you will visit me in Cambridge. I have a two-week holiday each year. And you will write? If the wood of my desk does not enter my soul... Forgive me. I am grateful to Mr Salt. He has been very kind. He found John a job and now he has found me a clerk's place in the East India Company. He must have lied worse than in court. They will probably kick me out the first time I add up a ledger. And please give my love to Mary. To my own dear sister. If I may call her that. She has to work so hard. And my mother does not value... Well, you know our home. All my mother ever thinks about is John. Mary will miss you. I shall miss you. childhood, in my joyful school days, all, all are gone, the old familiar faces. Friend of my bosom, thou more than a brother, why wert not thou born in my father's dwelling? So might we talk of the old familiar faces. has read my poem. He says it is good enough to publish. And so it is. Oh, where are my scissors? Oh, I wish you would just stop sewing for a few minutes, Mary. Father has been asking for you. He looks forward to playing cribbage with you all day long. I can't bear it, Mary. His mind wanders. He shakes when I think of what he once was, and now... Well, Mr Salt's death Mary, has changed him. Mary. It's changed us all, having to leave our home. Mary? 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 Mother is calling you. She calls all the time. All day, all night. She never even seems to sleep. But I must finish these shirts, or how will we pay the rent? Will you be here for dinner? The fellows from work are going to the theatre tonight. It is Mrs Simmons as Lady Macbeth! night and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold hold
is a sorry sight. Out, damn spot, out, I say. Hell is murky. Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. No, oh no, no, no. Hush, Mary, it's all right. But why are my hands red? Come, Mary, you must come with me. Let me wipe your hands. I can't go. I, I was carving the meat for dinner. Why is there blood here? Was the meat not cooked? Mother will be angry, Charles. She's calling for me, and I, I cannot bear her calling. Mary, you must trust me. I shall take care of you, I swear. Charles, where are we? I hope Paul will be well. We must be patient, but I cannot choose but weep. My brother shall know of it. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. On Friday afternoon, the coroner and jury sat on the body of a lady in the neighbourhood of Hoban, who died in consequence of a wound from her daughter the preceding day. While the family were preparing for dinner, the young lady seized a case knife lying on the table and with loud shrieks approached her parent. The jury, of course, brought in their verdict. Lunacy. Lunacy. Everything to his children, one good and two bad. The bad daughter drove him out to his death. First, first to madness, and he had nothing left. Her love is twice yours. What need twenty? What need one? There was another boy, and he tried to rescue the father. His poor old father. He carried him up the hill when the bad daughters had torn out his eyes. A burden up and up, dizzying steep. And he pretended to the mad king that he was mad too. Poor Tom's a cold. Poor Tom of Bethlehem. Poor Tom's a cold. Poor Tom of Bedlam, poor Tom's a cold. Poor Tom of Bedlam. <laughs> 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 you don't want to go to Bedlam, my dear. You won't find a nice warm fire like here. Not a nice kind nurse like me in Bedlam. <laughs> will you? I shall go to Bedlam. I know it. My brother will insist upon it. <laughs> Nonsense! Your nice brother is always coming and asking after you. Look at this lovely pie he brought for you. <laughs> oh, it's tasty, isn't it? Oh, it's a lovely pie, that is. <laughs> Your brother might bring a few coins for Nursey, eh? Poor Charles. Dear Charles. But John will insist. A brother to dominate over you with a high hand and a stern voice. Mother's favourite. A love more equal than your own. We have no money. How will Charles manage? No one to sew. No wages coming in. And nothing from John. 
Oh, oh, I shall go to Bedlam. Poor Tom. Poor Tom. And the foul fiend flippity gibbet. <laughs> Enough of the thing, dear. No money, is it? Well, that's a shame. Best make the most of kind old Nursey while you can. For awful to relate. Innocence and piety are not always successful in this world. And they have hanged my poor fool. We are come to a tragic end. You don't say, dear. Enough tragedy for one night. Try for a little laughter, dear. <laughs> no, there's no help for it. Strew her grave. <laughs> Oh, Mary, dearest Mary, I have come to fetch you home. I dreamt that you would rescue me. The Home Secretary has agreed. You are released into my care. Charles, what does John say? Who cares what John says? We will live us snug on my salary, as ever we can be. And I never want to see you so again. Never at all. Well, <laughs> Penny saved is a penny earned. We have London to entertain us. And what better play than the people walking up and down the Strand? We have books to read. And when we have read them, why, we can write our own. We have friends to visit us. And wit and good fellowship shall be written above the door. Oh, Mary, I have missed you so very much. Without you, I don't know what to do with myself. You are older and wiser and better than I. No, only older. Much better. But when I think... Don't think of it. <sighs> but I have to think of it, Charles. People will always point at us and we are in a manner marked. We are going to be happy. Hmm. Listen to this, Mary. A man is walking through town carrying a hair. Someone stops him and asks, is that your own hair or a wig? Funny, no? <laughs> I love your puns, Charles. But you know that the last play... <laughs> booed off on the first night. Why does nobody like my jokes? Well, the editor of the Gentleman's Magazine says he will take another essay. Oh, I'm no good with deadlines. All day at the office I worry about writing, and all evening when I should be writing I worry about the office. Well, maybe if you came straight home instead of to the tavern... Mary, journalists have to drink. It's compulsory. <laughs> Newspaper ink is mixed with wine. What a good thing I'm writing stories, though. Isn't it? Our publisher will be pleased. At least the tales of Shakespeare will make it to the printer on time. Have you finished? Yes, Measure for Measure, another comedy. Not that it's really very comic... Perhaps I should call it a tragedy comedy. Oh, read it to me. In the city of Vienna was a brother and a sister. Like us! The brother, Claudio, had seduced a girl. Uh, no young lady has ever let me seduce her. The sister, Isabel, was about to become a nun. <laughs> Are nuns allowed a second glass of wine? In the city of Vienna, there was a brother and a sister. Isabel was a serious young woman who was about to take the veil as a holy nun. Her brother Claudio was a wild young man. 
he had seduced a girl away from her parents and was living with her. Although they planned to marry, they had not yet done so. The Duke of Vienna decided to appoint a strict new judge named Angelo. At once, Angelo began to enforce the laws. Among the first in trouble was Claudio. He was taken to prison and sentenced to death. When Isabel was told the news, she left the convent and went straight to the judge to plead for mercy. Angelo was famous for his own purity of life. He was incorruptible, impossible to bribe. And yet now, seeing the lovely young nun begging for her brother's life, Angelo felt himself change. He offered her a terrible bargain. He would release Claudio, but only if she would agree to sin with him, just as her brother had done. Isabel refuses, horrified. But later, Isabel comes up with a trick. She manages to make Angelo think that she has spent the night with him, when instead, it was another woman. Angelo has been fooled, but he has no intention of keeping his word. Instead, he demands that Claudio must be beheaded immediately. The following day, Isabel accuses him in the open street. She curses him for his corruption and his lies. But Angelo denies everything. He accuses her of being mad. It seems as if Isabel will lose everything. She thinks her brother is dead. Nobody believes her. She will be thrown into prison as a mad woman. And although the play goes on to an almost happy ending, here is where we will end. With Isabel crying for justice, but knowing that she is helpless. For who will judge her complaint except the very judge who abused her? Where then do you turn when those in charge are the ones you fear? What hope is there when you are completely in their power? Mary! Goodwin says the first thousand copies have sold already. He has sent me a copy, Lamb's Tales of Shakespeare. Oh, doesn't it look fine? Oh, no, no. Our brother John, his illness was serious after all. Oh, Charles, our brother, I can't bear it. Oh, Mary, it's not your fault. Don't get ill, Mary. Don't leave me, Mary. No. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Death for death, haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure. Like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. Oh, it's wonderful, a wonderful poem. You are a genius, Coleridge. A very useless genius. No one pays a poet. You did the right thing sticking to your bank, Charles. I have to keep Mary in a private asylum. Oh, I could not let her go to Bedlam. How is she? Oh, she will recover. She always does. But every time we pray it will be the last. And it never is. And every time I think I cannot bear it, it is as if she is dead and I am lost. All my strength gone. You are still writing, Charles. Oh, I've given up on poetry. My essays are what sells. And in any case, in any case, I could never have written your ancient mariner or your Kubla Khan. <laughs> and I could never have written them without your help. I need your help now. Anything. You see, there is a little girl, Emma an orphan, the daughter of our old tutor. Mm. 
I want to help her, but I have no money, Charles. Of course, money for school. She must go to school. Girls should be taught as we were taught. Latin and English so she can write. Mathematics so she can keep a ledger. Oh, God bless you, Charles. You are the most generous man alive. <laughs> we are turning into an old pair of fools. Have another drink to check on how the first is doing. And then another to keep the second company. And a fourth to say it is not <laughs> the last. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played. And all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware! Beware! His flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice. And close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Goodwin says your new children's stories are a work of genius. Your stories, you mean? It may be my name on the cover, but everyone knows you wrote them, Mary. Is that a second bottle, Charles? A toast to our house move. We will be rid of all the visitors who come to drink us out of house and home. <laughs> it's not the visitors who do the drinking. To our retirement. No one will ever come as far as Enfield. You and Coleridge walked home in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> I was so ashamed. <laughs> a new story? Oh, tell it to me. There was a little girl that no one wanted, and she was called Emma Isola. A story about us at last. School holiday soon. We must take her to the theatre. She had no mother and no father to take care of her. And so she found an old brother and sister who agreed to look after her. She taught them how to be young again. And sometimes she was with them and sometimes she was at school. And when the old sister had to go away into banishment, she knew that the child would be a merry young friend to her brother. And that although she could not be with them, they were happy still. And just in thinking about the child and her brother, the sister was not happy perhaps, but not sad either. A mixture of tears and laughter together. dreamed of children last night and woke myself with weeping. I am so sorry, Charles. You never had a wife and children. Who would have married me with my stammer and my limp and my poor little collection of essays? I know you asked someone and she said no. Maybe it was because of me because you told her you would always care for your sister. I told her about me, about the madness in our blood. John had no children either. He was too afraid. At least we have Emma. 
and our friends. Mm, such good friends. Even visiting me in Enfield for a drink. Or two. Or five. Every night. Never was any poor devil so befriended as I. Oh, I wish Coleridge would come. That's who I want to see. A proper talk about poetry. And no drinking. <laughs> poor dear Coleridge. Friend and devil. Poet and genius. Drunk and addict. Dead at 52. His greatest poems uncompleted. <laughs> oh, he had a hunger for eternity. His great and dear spirit haunts me. Oh, I feel so alone without him. Mary, Mary, I need you. It is kind that you wish to come to us, Emma, but knowing that you are happy is our greatest happiness. The young man sounds delightful, although of course I will need to check that he is truly as kind as you say. Enfield was hell, and to escape from it even into a madhouse is the greatest sanity. I despair of London's heaven, so must sit me down in the halfway purgatory of Edmonton and be content. Mary's heart is obscured, not buried. It breaks out occasionally, and one can discern a strong mind struggling with the billows that have gone over it. I could be nowhere happier than under the same roof as with her. And of course... I am not drinking too much. I don't know what you mean. I see my poor mother, Charles. She smiles upon me. And I shall see her again in heaven. She will then understand me better. I'm going out. Don't drink any more, Charles, please. Dost think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale? And what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he is in Elysium. Perchance he is not drowned. What think you, sailors? I saw my brother, most provident in peril, bind himself to a strong mast that lived upon the sea, where, like Orion on the dolphin's back, I saw him hold acquaintance with the waves so long as I could see. The waves, indeed. <laughs> he drowned in a puddle. Unless you wish to say he drowned in wine first. <laughs> he looked so peaceful sleeping. He always did. Sleeping? <laughs> Keep thinking that if you can, dearie. And whatever will you do with no brother to care for you, dear? Just old nursey. <laughs> I have my adopted daughter and many friends. I have my books and my writing and money of my own. Go and fetch another log for the fire, if you please, and cut me a slice of pie. Now listen here, dearie. You will call me Miss Lamb, unless you wish me to leave here. 
and stop paying you a very handsome lodging fee. Oh, no, 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 no! Don't do that, Miss Lamb! Once, there was a brother and a sister. The sister waited 11 years for the brother to arrive. And then, when he had gone, she waited 13 years more until she joined him. Some said their story was a tragedy. But in Shakespeare, tragedy and comedy are so mixed together that no one can ever say which is which. A tragic comedy, Mary. perhaps. Mary! Come on, Mary. I want you to play bridge with us this evening. Even now, even at the end, like the not unpeaceful evening of a day made black by morning storms. Mary! Mary! I'm coming! I'm coming! I don't move as fast as I did. But this rough magic I here abjure, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sand, I'll drown my book.